Good day and welcome to this first in a series of uh, short video talks on the Reformation as it happened in England uh, during the 16th century. It's difficult to know where to begin in a series like this, but we shall, for purposes uh, that will become clear, begin at roughly the year 1500. Now one of the things that's necessary to understand is that there was only one church in England at this time. Indeed, there was only one church in all of Western Europe at this period in time. And it was known as the Christian Church or the Catholic Church. And a person in England considered themselves to be a Christian first and an Englishman or an Englishwoman second. Their faith was the primary thing which constituted their self sense of self. Now, while this series is not going to focus entirely on personalities, still there is uh, the necessity to speak about a few, and obviously one of those is King Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII ruled in England from 1509 to 1547, and uh, despite uh, what people might suspect, he was not the second son, and not the he was the second son, and not necessarily the heir to the throne. When his older brother died, then Henry, who had been being trained for a life in the church, became the heir to the throne. Now, Henry, as a young man, when he came to the throne at 18, was a very talented individual. He was exceedingly athletic. He could ride, he could wrestle, he could run with the very best in the kingdom. And also, he was, of course, very well educated. Uh, he was educated in history, but especially theology. And also, uh, he had many languages. He could speak Latin and Greek and French and Spanish and English very well. But above all, he was a devoted son of the church, a devoted Catholic of Western Europe. Now, he also had, within England of that time, uh, he couldn't run the country all by himself. He had to have chief ministers of the government. Uh, and one of those was, not surprisingly, and many of them were actually churchmen, uh, various forms of clergy, particularly bishops and cardinals. And one of those who was Henry's right-hand man was an Englishman by the name of Cardinal Wolsey. He, Cardinal Wolsey had uh, climbed up from very humble beginnings and had become a very powerful man both in the church uh, with an appointment from the Pope and also a very important man in Henry's court and Henry's chief minister, minister of running the country. So Cardinal Wolsey was a very important person. Now, of course, the other person we have to mention at this time, or position we have to mention, is that of the Pope, who lived in Rome and ruled the Western Christian Church from there. The Pope was the earthly head of the Western Christian Church. Scotland, Wales, England, all of continental Europe and Mediterranean Europe came under his immediate jurisdiction. And the Pope's jurisdiction constituted of two things. One, it was jurisdictional, uh, that is, he had a hand in the appointments of bishops and archbishops, and but also it was jurisdictional in the sense of he derived taxes or income from all the church scattered throughout Western Europe. Now, one of these very common taxes was a sort of poll tax called Peter Pence, and every household through all of Western Europe, including England, had to pay a small Peter Pence tax that went to Rome each and every year. And so the Pope had this jurisdictional control over some things in England and also this taxation. For instance, if a bishop died and someone new was going to come into the office, they had to pay a special tax to the Pope when they came into possession of the new bishopric. And that could be quite a bit of money because, of course, uh, bishoprics were very large jurisdictions in some cases and it built up over the centuries. They controlled uh, not just the parish churches, but the monasteries, and there was much land that had been given to the church, and this was rented out, and there were leases and rent income and taxes and fees that was paid into the bishop of the bishopric each and every year. So some of the bishoprics were very powerful and very wealthy things to be the bishop of. Uh, fine. Uh, also, there was what was known as a church court system, a separate church court system that ran parallel to the secular church system or court system. And then this church court system, uh, clergy could be tried, including for serious criminal cases, uh, instances of rape or even of murder. The clergy would be tried in these church courts. And the church courts tended to be very lenient and not near as severe as the secular courts. And 
the other problem with this court system that many people thought needed reform was that it didn't just apply to who we would consider to be the clergy. Uh, the definition of clergy had expanded in recent centuries to include, include greeters at the door, bell ringers, wardens, sidesmen, sextons, candle makers even. And so if you got in the trouble you uh, and you were one of those individuals who had one of those offices, you would seek to be tried in the court system of the church because the punishment would be much less severe. Now I did mention the business about the bishoprics and uh, the power of the bishops. And that's something important to remember because the bishops also often participated in two other abuses that took place at this time. One was known as absenteeism. That is to say, a man would be appointed to a bishopric and in order to gain the income from it, and he'd never go there, and he'd never function as a bishop there. He'd hire some poor fellow to do the role and work of a bishop and pay him a minor fee, and he'd derive all the income from the bishopric to his own pockets, and he may never even ever go to that actual geographic location. That was known as the abuse of absenteeism. And sometimes uh, someone in Rome held a bishopric in England, derived the majority of the income from it, and he hired some local follow to actually do the work of the bishop. Now there was attached to this absenteeism the other abuse known as pluralism. And pluralism is where an, a man, uh, a bishop very often, would hold more than one of these positions. He may be the, the bishop of, of say Salisbury and at the same time uh, be the abbot of a monastery in Northumbria and also be an archdeacon of the cathedral in Coventry. And he may never go to any of those places. He may hold those three positions derive the income from all three and hire some poor saps to do the actual work and he pocketed all the money and there was a the thought that this was not a good practice and was not good for the church. Now finally what was what were church services like at roughly the year 1500 and of course this involves a fair amount of generalization but nonetheless uh, it's important to remember that in your typical village or town the church building or buildings were the dominant structures large stone structures beautiful structures built centuries before and incorporating and encompassing all the wealth that the community had the church influenced the individual from cradle to grave, from baptism to burial. There was a church year, and the church year had the various seasons. There were penitent seasons, as Advent and Lent. There were seasons of celebration, like Easter and Pentecost. There were also times of fasting, like Fridays and Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, and times of celebration, like Easter and the fall harvest season. And there was even, if you were a typical Christian in England, the possibility, maybe, although most people didn't travel more than five miles from their home where they were born, there was even a possibility maybe of going on a pilgrimage once in your life. And there was a major pilgrimage site in England at Canterbury for the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket, who an earlier king of England who had executed because he was too independent minded. Now the typical Sunday service was something like this. It was always the communion service, always the mass. And it was said by the priest alone, up front, by the high altar, and it was said in Latin, which no one could read or understand. Sometimes not even the priest could understand everything that he was saying. The congregation stood in the church. There were no pews, there were no hymn books, there was no singing, very often there was no sermon, and the people did not receive a Holy Communion at all. At the end of the service, a loaf of blessed bread was passed around, not the Holy Communion, and everyone took a piece. And they also passed the piece, which often involved the kissing of a holy pitcher, something like an icon. And so the typical service uh, was something which the people attended, but they didn't really participate in. And it took place at the very far front of the church, behind the rood screen. At the front, before the choir section of the church, would be a rood screen, a very elaborate wooden structure, on the top of which was a very important scene, the crucifixion scene. St. John was on the one side, the Blessed Virgin was on the other, and the crucified Savior was on the cross in the middle. This scene was what people saw when they looked to the front of the church. And these 
these were elaborate, carved, often wooden figures, and they're absolutely beautiful pieces of artwork. And that's what the people contemplated when they were in church, their Savior dying on the cross for their sins. And as they left the church, there was another visual, instructional thing for them to see, didactic in its intent. That is to say, as they went out the west door of the church, as they left the church, they saw the doom above the door that is a depiction of doomsday that is of our Lord as judge of living and the dead in the center and the damned on the one side and the saved on his right hand side and that was what they contemplated as they left the church that their Lord who had died for their sins was also to come as a judge of living and the dead and that's how people uh, understood and learnt about their faith also there were some stained glass windows and also paintings on the walls of the church, which would be very instructive as well, both biblical scenes and scenes from the lives of the saints. Now, as I said, there wasn't much preaching in the church, but there was preaching in existence in the realm of England at this time often by the friars, the Franciscans or the Benedictines. These were holy orders, not monks in monasteries, but holy orders outside the monastery that lived in small grouping within the community. Uh, they taught the people, they preached often quite well, and they helped. They were the ones that actually helped establish the concept of hospitals. They, ha they indeed did run the hostels and they gave care to the sick and to the dying and they were usually based upon the motto of humility, poverty, and chastity which if you think about the king in his court and Cardinal Wolseley with all their wealth and all their uh, position of education and of wealth and of property this humility and poverty and chastity of the friars constitutes quite a contrast. That gives us just a peek into the state of public religion and the state of the church in England at roughly the year 1500 when the Reformation or the beginning of stirring of the need for serious change and reform was beginning to simmer and beginning to come to a public consciousness. Thank you very much and please stay tuned for the second installment in this series to be released in one week's time. Thank you.